If you're not giving, you are missing out. And again, if you think there's any kind of thing in this that's give to this, do not give to this. Give to other things. Please be generous and see that this blessing is just, you're missing out if you don't have it. God, we have such a generous God. So if you've come along, welcome. If someone's dragged you, welcome. If you found your way here, welcome. If this is your first time at any church ever, anywhere, anytime, especially welcome. We love that you're here. We really do. Um, Normally, I would give a bit of a talk for sort of 20 to 30 minutes on a bit of a topic. But before I do that, before I get stuck into anything, I want to invite a couple of very good friends of mine up on the stage. So can we make Luke and Trudy and Elijah feel really welcome? We just give them a massive round of applause. Thanks, church. These guys have been long-time friends of mine, and I would share their story on their behalf, but they're here and a part of our church, and so I want them to to kind of be able to share their story for us. Um, So I'm going to just ask them a few questions, leave it to them to share, um, but we're going to start a little bit romantic. Where did it all start for you guys? How did the journey begin? Um, So I began going to a um, lounge group called Coleman Lounge Group. Uh, in 2011. Um, I think Trudy was a bit earlier than that. Um, we both went to the same high school, but we never really saw each other at high school. Um, I noticed that she kept looking at me with these starry eyes at lounge group. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is my version of the story, anyway. <laughs> um, I think it went on for about a year. Um, she'd keep looking at me and wouldn't, wouldn't leave me alone, so you know, eventually, um, yeah, I took her out to a date on, where was it, Mount Cooper, um, and yeah, that's, that's, where it, <laughs> that's where it began, um, I think it was Christmas Day, um, so yeah, anything to add? That's so true, it's not really, Luke chased me for a year, and I was a rat, and I didn't, <laughs> and I, I wasn't keen, and then I like, came to the light of like, he's amazing, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say something. <laughs> Very cool, guys. Something else happened at that life group, that lounge group that you were there together at. Can you tell us a bit of that story? What happened? Um, that's where we came to know God, and that was through like Jace and Hydes and the Coleman family um, and the other people that were already there showing their love to us. Like we were just going for Friday night hangs and we're doing beach trips on a Saturday. Woo! And um, yeah, just doing life together. And then through the love that they showed us and kindness and like not judging us, because um, we're doing some questionable things, I was. Um, it j- <laughs> well, I won't expand on that. And through that, like through that love, we're like, oh, this is really cool. Like these people are just showing us love even though they don't even know us. Like what is this? And obviously as time went on, we realized that's actually the love that Jesus showed them and they're called to then show other people. So yeah, we both met Jesus through that <laughs> um, lounge group together and it was really awesome. It was really life-changing. That was so cool to be a part of that with you guys. Uh, absolutely. Is there, like what are the ways then... Um, for either of you guys you want to share what are the biggest ways that Jesus has changed your life then since meeting him Um, just quickly for me it obviously is the way that I do life and then my career change as well I was doing primary school um, teaching like studying at uni and then that didn't work out and then I met like Steph and then she paid for me to go and splash out and that really propelled me into the chaplaincy realm and it was incredible that was my favourite job bar being a mum Um, And that just really grew me as a person and loving on the community. So, yeah, that's how it kind of changed that. And then showing love to people around me as well and my family who are non-Christian, trying to show them the love of Jesus, even though they're like, oh, Jesus. Um, Just really trying to have that heart um, for people and the people we meet and just in our workplaces and now as a mum. Can you repeat the question? (laughs) How has Jesus changed your life, mate? What are the biggest ways um, internally, externally here? Um, Yep, so fundamentally from like lounge group days, um, yeah, we were chasing that, like why were people so interested in us? Um, And you could see that they were all genuine about it. Um, So 
so over time, when we got to um, ask all the hard questions um, to Jason Hydes and um, John Coleman and the other Coleman's, um, and our friends as well that brought us to Lounge Group, um, that sort of that um, fundamental change began um, in us, um, where you you'd sort of see value in everyone, um, like everyone that you come in contact with, um, they, they were deserving of your time, um, and you could see that. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus is not here just for you and people you liked. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, and that, that changes you from the inside. It, take, look, it takes years. Um, it's obviously everyone's journey. Um, it's a lifelong thing. But, yeah, it, you can't imagine life now without um, Christ and like the foundation of Christianity. Um, it just, it's in your mind and it's, yeah, it's part of everything you do these days. So, yeah, that's how it changed, that's how it changed me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so good. Thanks, guys. Last one then, and you can take the little man off. He's such a star. Um, the questions about him. You guys now have little Elijah. Um, what, what are your hopes and dreams for him? What are your hopes and dreams for him? Um, yeah, Elijah's a legend. We love him. Um, we'll have many more of him. But for him personally, just really keen to see him grow in his faith. And he's going to have like that unwavering faith. Like, you know, how there's people like no matter what they go through and they're just like so strong. That's definitely going to be Elijah and just such a lover of the world. And like there'll be no fear of anything. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. <laughs> Good times. We rehearse this. Um, yeah, it's no fear. Like, you know when sometimes fear of like, oh, I don't want to go to that nation or across there because that's like a bit scary. Like, man says that's scary, but he'll be the one that'll be like, no, like if it's if God's called it, then it's possible. You know, what's impossible with man, it's possible with God. So I definitely feel like you're going to have an unwavering faith um, and really keen to see that as he grows up. Did you want to add anything? Um. Elijah. Um, obviously we want the best for Eli um, so when it comes time for him to make a decision or um, yeah whatever his journey looks like um, yeah I guess that you know our hope is that he would he would choose Jesus um, early um, and yeah, my hope is for him that he's, he's very gentle um, and loving and, yeah, gets to know Jesus so he's, he can um, replicate who Jesus is um, to other people. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a simple hope, but, yeah, that's all we want, I guess, for him. I don't have any grand plans for him. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Can we just thank these guys, eh? That's so cool. Such a good story. Thanks, Raj. Thanks, mate. If you haven't already figured it out, that wasn't rehearsed. That was all off the cuff. And I hope you see that, that there was no rehearsal there. That's authentic. That's just real. That's just them. It's been such a privilege to be a part of their journey. Um, and to just to see, yeah, their lives change. And now to know the hopeful little Elijah. Um, yeah. I said before, if you're new to church, if this whole thing is new for you, um, that we love that you're here. How can I say that from the front if I have no idea who you are? The reason is because we believe something so wholeheartedly here that we come out on a Sunday voluntarily. None of us have to be here. None of us, there's nothing about this that's a tick the box so that God's happy with us. There's something that brings us together. That something's actually a someone. It's Jesus. We sung about him before. It's a person. Christianity, if you're wondering, in a nutshell, is just following Jesus, following this person. Because we believe this person is actually God, God in the flesh. And that because of that, following him, he, he knows what life is best for us humanity, us humans. He knows what the best life is. And so following him, you would expect, is the best life. It's the one that's going to make the most sense, the one that's going to work the best and fit together the best for humanity. And part of this story, and I can tell you it's changed my life. You heard that it's changed theirs in many ways, Luke and Trudy. It'll change yours too. And the part of this journey is inviting others in. There is no bar 
that anyone has to achieve before they can start following Jesus. We can just invite him into that place. They can just come into our home and be a part of life with us and start following Jesus with us. My parents were a huge part of the journey for Luke and Trudy, just opening their home, bringing people on that journey to follow Jesus. This is our mission. This is why we come together. This is why we gather. This is why we go out and we do our things. It's why we have all of the events we just talked about. It's why we give. It's why we take our kids out and we love them really well at their level. All of these things that we do are about following Jesus and inviting others to do the same. It's our mission. This is where it all lands for me, though, in the context of this whole series. There's a timeline on our mission. There's a timeline on our mission. Death marks the end of it. After that, there'll be no more invitation. No more making new followers of Jesus. No more inviting people to follow him. We'll have had our opportunity, and it'll be over. That'll be the end of it. So for me, seeing generational change, to see Luke and Trudy, to see them come together and to see a little Elijah, that for me, and I know for many of you, is worth everything. It is worth absolutely everything we have while we have the chance. That right there. And this is actually where we find ourselves as a church. For years, this has been the heart of our church. We started 15, 16 years ago, and this has been our heart ever since. Our passion is that people would follow Jesus and they would come with us in following Jesus. And our journey has actually led us to the foot of a mountain. That's what we keep feeling like in the offices. We talk about this, what's ahead of us. It feels like being at the foot of a mountain. The mountain is actually a mountain of cash, a mountain of money, two and a half million dollars. We've talked about it the last couple of weeks. It's our huge goal. It's a mountain because when you look around, we're not exactly a wealthy bunch. We're not exactly a massive bunch. If there was a couple of million of us, this would be easy. But it's huge, right? It's absolutely massive. The question is, how are we going to do it? How are we going to climb this mountain? Because it's all well and good to have all the excitement and all the passion and energy in the world for this, but if there are things in our way, huge mountains that are going to stop us, we can't just walk around them, right? We can think differently about things, and certainly we have over the years, but we are confident that God's led us to the foot of this mountain, and we're to tackle this, we're to do this together. Thankfully, we have a predecessor. There's a lot of predecessors throughout history that have done way crazier things than us. Thankfully, we aren't the first to do this. But we're going to look today at a passage in the Bible that looks at a church that had this incredible generosity about them and their story. It's from Paul. So Paul wrote to this church in Corinth. And he looks at this church and goes, wow, there's something going on here, and I need to talk to you guys about this, to the other churches. I think it's actually a life-changing principle when we get stuck into it. So if you have your Bibles, you can open to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. If you don't know what that is, Google it, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. We'll start with chapter 8. It'll also be on the screen, so you're welcome to just follow along there with me. But we'll read a bit of a passage, and then we'll get stuck into it. Let's go from the top. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we'd hoped for, For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we've urged Titus, who encouraged you giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel, I want you also, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. And a bit later on in chapter 9, the story goes on. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. 
As the scriptures say, they share fle- freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Yeah, this guy Paul, he had, he had this crazy experience of God, right? This miraculous experience. It wasn't even in a dream. He was stopped in the middle of some outback road by this incredible, what, what he thought at first was a vision, but was Jesus appearing to him. It's this crazy experience. So you would think this guy, if he's after funds for something, he's raising money for something, for churches, whatever it is, that he would just ask God, right? He'd say, God, you're a crazy, miraculous God. Can you just do your thing and make it happen for me? But he doesn't do that. He instead realises that actually what God did at that point was then sent him out. Jesus sent him out to go and share this good news. Jesus could have just done the same thing to every other person, just appear to them. But he's like, no, Paul, I want you to go. I want you to share this message, this news. And so Paul knows it's the same concept that's going to work with these churches, that actually God's going to work through his people. He's going to work through each of the people that are part of these churches in their hearts, in their minds, to be generous, to come up with what it is that God wants to achieve with these people. And so if we're standing here at the foot of this mountain, I think that's where we need to start. This actually happens with us. We should absolutely pray that God does something incredible for us and comes through in amazing ways. Because to be honest, if we get there, God's done something phenomenal. But it takes us. It takes God working through us to bring about his purposes. And so in this passage, Paul seems, he seems pretty blown away by this church, this Macedonian church, back in chapter 8. The question I have then is what is it about them? What is it about the Macedonian church that allowed them to be so joyfully generous? It's that they had abundant joy. That is a question for me because if you think about generosity, it's counterintuitive. Yes? Giving is counterintuitive. What's intuitive and normal for us is to budget, is to save money for a rainy day, pardon the pun, is to make sure we've got a buffer, kind of go along doing life like that, making sure we earn enough to cover our expenses. All of these things are normal. They're normal ways to act. To give your money away is not normal. It's not intuitive. What's more than that, to give your money away joyfully, that's just completely unnatural. Completely unnatural. But, as a natural saver, personally, This is actually something that I can say, and I get to share a bit of my story today, that's actually transformed my life in a really big way. And so I want to share a bit of my story today because there's something about this that is just life-giving. It is a life-giving and life-changing principle. It's amazing, and it's something that I don't want you to miss out on. And I've wrestled with this message all week as I've talked with my wife, Heidi, with my senior pastor, Dan, on what to share today. And I really, that is my heart, that you would take away hope from today and excitement about what God could do. So let's get stuck into it. And a quick disclaimer, actually, before we do that. If you think this is some kind of weird, I don't know, weird kind of twist, reverse psychology thing so that you would give to this project, hear me categorically now, do not give to us if you're at all doubting. Okay? Come and talk to me. I'd love you to talk to me, ask questions about everything. We want to be completely transparent with our money. I'm actually the one overseeing all of the church's money, if you're wondering, so I'm very happy to be transparent and open about that. But if you're at all sceptical about any of it, what I want you to get today, what I want you to get out of today, is that joyful generosity blesses your life. Okay? That's it. Give somewhere else. Give to an organisation, to a friend, to whoever needs that, but be generous and watch what God does. That's the message for today, okay? Disclaimer aside, let's get stuck into it. I think there are two things that this Macedonian church has got a hold of, or two things about their generosity, or that's kind of informed their generosity. Um, There's no alliteration. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) As a Baptist pastor, uh, I can't do alliteration very well. So the OCD in the room, like me, um, I've failed you. I'm sorry. Those two things do not start with the same letter, despite Dan doing so well every week. I don't know how you do it, mate. Good on you. This is the Macedonian path to joyful generosity. First one's this. They were exceedingly grateful. The Macedonians were exceedingly grateful. 
Uh, on New Year's Day last year, uh, I was with my family up at Noosa, at Noosa Beach, north of the kind of rock wall, if you know Noosa Beach at all, sort of outside the patrol area, but where lots of families go. I was with my brother and his family, my other brother and his family, and my mum and dad, so there's a whole group of us there. And my brother and I were out swimming, kind of treading water, waiting for the big sets of waves to come in. We were just chatting away. And we saw these two strongly built uh, men of Asian heritage come in. That's an important point in the story. Came in the water, make an absolute racket. We just thought they were kind of being macho, being tough, like they were units. We thought, oh yeah, okay. They're just kind of attracting the attention. That makes sense. As we're watching them, we see, we actually notice something weird. We're like, this doesn't seem right. They're not, they're kind of, they're kind of drawing attention to themselves, but it doesn't sound right. And so we're kind of watching, we're probably me to the back of the room away, maybe a little closer, 20, 30 metres. We realise as we're kind of watching, we've grown up in the surf around beaches, we realise they're actually in the middle of a rip. The water's moving really fast all around them, and these guys are getting dragged out. We're above our heads treading water. We're doing that all right, but these guys are battling. We realise what's happening is they're going up and down, in and out of the water. And as they're coming up, they're yelling and screaming because they're trying to get a breath before they go back under. So they're obviously not confident swimmers. But these guys are trapped in this rip. Now, where, if you know the rock wall at Noosa, north of that, the only lifeguard there is right on the top of that hill. They have a little tower. The rest of them are all down where the flags are, probably where we should have been swimming. But that part of the story aside, we're watching these guys, and John and I are like, we have to go and do something here. These guys are in strife. Like, they're clearly freaking out and panicking. And if you know water, you know that that's an absolute disaster waiting to happen because you need to keep you calm, especially in a rip. So we start swimming over to them like idiots, not really thinking about what we're doing because neither of us have our bronze medallion, but just have been in a, in a bit of a panic ourselves for these two blokes. We swim over, and again, if I was bronze medallion, I should probably get in, be getting some coaching off Rach down here. I'm gonna, I should be getting behind him and sort of holding them up because these are big dudes, right? Instead, I come beside him. I kind of grab his shoulder. I'm trying to talk to him. He can clearly understand nothing I'm saying to him. He's just freaking out, looking at me with his big eyes and just pushing me under the water. So I'm kind of... Oh, <laughs> Kicking, coming back up, getting my breath and looking at him going under again. I'm dragging him down, so it's an absolute disaster, right? We're pulling each other under the water in the rip, moving further out now than we were, and they obviously can't swim. This chaos ensues for about sort of, I'm going to say five to six minutes. It wasn't ages, but it was definitely long enough that a 13-year-old lifeguard legged it out into the water, got pounded by a couple of waves and couldn't make it out. So he was stuck in there. So we're out in the water. And there was no one else coming behind him. He's freaking out, yelling at the lifeguard town. No one's coming. So we're out there with these guys, and we're just, just getting, like, the big sets start to come in. So I'm trying to get the dude's attention and go, you know, kind of half point at the wave, and then he's just panicking, looking at me, and then, boom, smashed by a big wave. And that happens for, yeah, probably five to six minutes. Eventually, I found we're getting tumbled around, and then I come up, we try and grab each other again. That we're actually standing on ground. So, not because of any heroics at all of me and my brother, but purely by God's grace and huge waves at Noosa where we saved that day because we could have all drowned, I think. Sorry, parents, to share this story with you now because they're probably freaking out, didn't know this story. So we made it back to, to, to dry, well, almost dry ground. And these, like, these guys clearly couldn't speak in English. But we start walking in with them, and as they're kind of shaking up, sort of feeling they have starts to wear off because they realise they're back on dry ground. We could tell... As you'd expect, we could tell. These guys are just looking at us. They cannot say a word of English. They're just super, super grateful. Because they realised what they started doing, what they thought they could do, they couldn't do. And they certainly couldn't do it to the point of death, right? They'd escaped to death is how they felt. They now are safe again and they're, they're alive and well. I, th I wanted to share that because I think that's the kind of feeling in a very real way that the Macedonian church felt that they were exceedingly grateful because they had escaped death. That's what they'd done. In their minds and in their eyes, they had escaped death in a very real way. Let me read a couple of those passages again. Verses 2, 5, and 9 talks about them. They are also filled with abundant joy despite their troubles and poverty. They're filled with abundant joy. Their first action was to give themselves to God like a response to God's goodness. And then it says, it kind of confirms it all, wraps up in verse 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. 
It's the generosity of Jesus that caused them to be generous. What more could they ask for than life itself? In their minds, what else could they do in response to a God who had literally died in their place, who had not just helped them escape death, but actually died in their place? What's crazy about this is that it made them not just willing despite their poverty, it made them eager, like eager, like, a, like an excitement, an energy to give you money. Like that is completely counterintuitive. So I'm going to think that they were exceedingly grateful to think on and dwell on and understand what has happened to them, how they've been set free, how they've escaped death. I don't think that's it though. I think that's part of the picture. I think there's more to it than that though because it says here quite clearly they had many troubles and were very poor. There's a lot of, yeah, maybe extreme poverty, I'm not sure. Maybe persecution, all sorts of things are going on for them. And so unless, in my mind, unless they're willing to die early, <laughs> go without, like go without food and water and the basics of life to get through, there must have been something else that they held on to that allowed them, or that they believed that allowed them to be super generous, right? To be notably generous. I think it's this. This is the second point that I grabbed from this passage. They knew God would bless them. Not they knew God would provide for them. They knew God would bless them for their generosity. Uh, I said before, I'm a saver. I'm not a good spender. I started working at 12, legally. I was, um, like, not illegally, actually legally. I was refereeing in uh, kind of lining soccer games as a little kid. Uh, I then started doing tutoring and all sorts of things through school, finished school, um, yeah, doing all those things. And at 18 and 19, Heidi and I bought our first house. Uh, so my, my kind of personality type, is, I, said, I jokingly said OCD before, that is my personality type, is that kind of... I'd like to think diligent, responsible. Maybe it's more than that. <laughs> People who know me are laughing. That's good. Um, the problem with this, though, the problem with my personality type is I saw generosity in giving as something you do. That's what you do. That's what you should do. It's the right thing to do. Tick the box. Give to God because that's what he's asked us to do. So I'll do that. And while maybe when I first came to faith for a little bit in my early teens, there was some joy about that because it was a response. It was, I was exceedingly grateful as I come to kind of start to understand what this, this whole thing is about and what Jesus had done for me. That quickly wore off. And if I'm honest, I probably lost sight of that along the way. And it just become this tick the box thing. Then I remember hearing this sermon. It was actually at LifePoint. It was City Life back then in Kelvin Grove. I was about 20, 21. Um, and the idea in a nutshell of this sermon was, I dare you to see if you can outgive God. I dare you to see if you can outgive God. I remember talking to Heidi about this on the way home, going, What do you think of that? Like, that's, what do we do about this? Should we do something about this? Like, this is, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty big challenge, right? I dare you to outgive God. And so we thought, all right, do we try this? Maybe in our youthful enthusiasm or excitement or passion and hope, maybe we should give this a shot. But then we thought, how the heck do you do that? How do you try and actually put this into practice? How do you try and outgive God? And so we came up with this. Every year, we'll increase the percentage of our total income that we're giving away. So every year, we expect that we'll earn more. And so if we we're keeping up the same, then we would give more dollars. But we want, to, we want to try and test this out, actually test God on this. We want to try and increase the percentage of our giving that we're giving away every year of our total income. Now, I want to share, I said before, I want to share a bit of this story of our giving. And I struggled, I struggled all week to share this because, and I hope if you know me here, you know that my heart and my intention is for you, okay? There is no reverse psychology in this. There is no trying to say, look at me, or look at what we've done. This is the story of the truth of our lives because I can share a couple of examples of God's coincidental blessing, you might say, of different experiences. And you could as well. The problem in my mind as the engineer, rational, OCD type is that you can very easily rationalise them off as coincidence or, or as some happenstance story. What I'm about to share with you, I want to demonstrate to you that God is a, has a pattern and is in the business of being the God who creates the pattern of abundant generosity and abundant blessing 
in response to our testing of him, you might say, or in response to our attempt to be generous, our attempt to outgive God. This is what I want to show you as I kind of unfold the last sort of 13 years of our lives, okay? If you're new to church, come and talk to me afterwards, get to know me. Please know that that is my heart, my intention. I'm not here trying to share a story about how good we are or anything like that. The reason, part of the reason I want to share this too is I think this is, I think this is the case for anything in their life that we keep in the dark is that we don't have the opportunity to grow and be discipled in it. I think we know that. We know it from Scripture, but I think we know it to be true in real life. Anything that's kept in the dark, it's very easy to either head down the path of making it worse or at the very least not grow and change and be discipled. And I actually think in the West, maybe it's the enemy, maybe it's our own doing. Keeping money in the dark, keeping it very private and secret, doesn't allow us to grow and be discipled in that. I think wealth and greed and those sorts of things are kind of tied up in this idea that actually money is a private thing and we don't have the chance to be discipled in it. Now, I know the other side of this is, is dangerous as well. We need to be careful of that. But I think leaning hard on that has left us in a place where we don't get to talk about this in an open and honest and real way that actually disciples us, all right? That's the second reason. Now, let me share a bit of our story uh, and then I'll kind of wrap this whole thing up. This is the result of our last 13 years or so. So we give our first tenth, this is Heidi and I, we give our first tenth to the church. On a monthly basis, we also support uh, my brother in Costa Rica, Bible League Australia, a missionary Jean-Claude and his family to the Yahweh people of Africa, the Bullock family in Colombia, the persecuted church through Open Doors organisation, uh, Martyr Children's Hospital. Um, we're just about to take on our fourth compassion child so each of our kids can have one of their own. Um, We've been contributing to the building fund for the last three years on a monthly basis. Um, We gave a significant amount to the deposit for the church land that we bought down the road when we bought that. Um, We gave our Kia Grand Carnival to the church a couple of years ago. Uh, We've just given a significant amount uh, to the building fund, the Building for the Generations Fund. Um, Us pastors have is going first. In the same period of time, the exact same period of time, Heidi got a significant redundancy at 23, at 23, a redundancy, unexpected at the time, but right when our twins were on the way. We have oldest twins, we have four kids, oldest twins. We've bought and sold houses four times, we've continued to pay down our mortgage over time, we lapped Australia in a camper and four-wheel drive that were paid for by a property subdivision that we did out at Moray Field, we were blessed to, to have the opportunity to do that. We went to Bali for our honeymoon uh, and then New Zealand a year later because our honeymoon was rubbish. We went to uh, Costa Rica. It was, you can talk to me about that later, it was rubbish. Poor Heidi had Bali belly for like a week and a half, two weeks, it was awful. Um, We went to Costa Rica for my brother's wedding a few years ago. We went on a cruise to Vanuatu for our 10 year wedding anniversary. We've had our desire met that Heidi could be at home with our kids until Jack was back at school. Our kids were accepted into Mueller um, they were, we were late to the party there, but God's grace, they're accepted into a meal and they still go there, which is not a cheap exercise. Uh, we live close to school and church in a property that we drove past and we dreamed about living in when we drove past it coming from Morayfield. While we're doing the subdivision, we drive past it going, how cool would it be to live there? That would be so good. But buying a property in Rothwell at the time was like impossible. Everyone wants to be in there. It kind of still is hard. Everyone wants to be close to uh, Mueller, I think, or this area. I don't know why. Maybe it's the Mozzies. Um, <laughs> And then right at the moment, right at the moment, we're in the middle of doing a big uh, patio extension to our house. So we'd love to have bigger groups around, our family, our friends, people in the church, hosting young ads, that sort of stuff. We'd love to just have this massive space. And again, construction costs in Queensland, not a good time to do it. But we just want to be outside, again, enjoying the mozzies of Rothwell. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 9, it says this. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. The Macedonians must have known this much better than I do and much earlier than I did. But actually, this is a God who does not just provide, but he blesses for their generosity. It must be, 
what they saw. Heidi and I cannot believe, we talk about it all the time, we cannot believe how much we are blessed in the life that we have. We, we, there's absolutely no right for us to be blessed the way we are, and we are so grateful to God because he's so gracious. I don't think, we're 13 years in, I don't think we'll ever be able to outgive God. And I challenge you with that. I don't think you can either. I can categorically tell you now, we give cheerfully. Because it's easy to give cheerfully, right? When that is your life, there's no, oh, hey, look at us. We're cheerful when we give. That has been the pattern of the God that we have. That has been the pattern of, our, of our God's blessing in our life. We cannot help but cheerfully give. It's just normal now. I used to think giving meant going without missing out. I actually, I genuinely think it's the opposite way around now. If you're not giving, you are missing out. And again, if you think there's any kind of thing in this that's give to this, do not give to this. Give to other things. Please be generous and see that this blessing is just, you're missing out if you don't have it. God, we have such a generous God. As a quick aside, by the way, that elder that Dan spoke about a couple of weeks ago that gave first, he went first in our meeting and said, you know what, I'm excited to give. He's a cheerful giver as well. He said, I'm going to give $30,000 to this. And just know, guys, he has the same mindset. I just want to be open about this. He's like, just know, guys, we're saving up for a house. So this is, this is big for us, but this is how much we're bought in. We're keen, we're excited. Uh, I think of the next week, his wife, who's, I don't think, working at the moment, still looking after Bob, got an email out of the blue from her employer saying, oh, look, by the way, um, we've revised your pay band at work. Um, we're backdating the start of it as well. It's gone up. Uh, so it's going to mean an extra sort of a paycheck for you of $13,000. A week later, out of the blue, a week after they said this, God knowing that they're saving up for a house. Crazy, right? Now, listen in. One more thing as well. In case you've been hearing... Listen, if you've been tuning out, please listen in there. In case you've been hearing this false idea that you give so that God gives you more. All right? That false idea. Or the false idea that God wants you to be rich and he wants you to be wealthy. Both of them has as a, have as a motivation and the baseline as greed, as want for us. The motivation is wrong. Those things are wrong. That is not at all what I'm saying. Here's why God blesses. That same passage. And plenty left over to share with others. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. That is why God blesses. That is why. And if you think about God, and he wants the best for this world, he wants this whole world to be blessed, and he's got people who are being generous and giving away, would it not make sense that he would continue to be generous and bless them so that they would continue to do the thing he wants us to do in this world? This is why. This is why God blesses. Now, there are a bunch of you who are sitting here that already know all of this to be true. And I would love you to get up here and share your story because I'll bet it absolutely blows Heidi and I out of the water of God's consistent blessing in your life and seeing him just come through time and time again and not just provision, but in blessing. And so what Dan said last week about saying, Father, what should I give? That's the, kind of the challenge last week. You've already wrestled with that. God already has told you and you've moved forward and you're excited and happy about where all this is going. That's good. If not... If this isn't, if that's not you and you're not sure yet, as from one family to another, please do not miss out on this chance. Don't miss out on this chance. Again, give elsewhere if you don't want to give to us. Don't miss out on this Macedonian giving. It's unnatural and it's extravagant. It is very different to this world. It is counterintuitive, but it is, like so many other things that are counterintuitive with Scripture, it is the path to joy. It's the path to life. It's a path that you will not regret. Trust me on that. You will not regret it. Your life will be all the richer because of it. Here's one way to start. Because you have to get practical, right? I'm a very practical guy. This dude said to me one time, dude I look up to, such a generous guy, and I just, I just want to learn from him. So I'm talking to him one day. I'm like, how did you get there? What was, your, what was your story? And he said, here's something that really re sat with me, Jay. Someone just challenged me on this. He said, if you're, uh, if you're about ready to go and buy a car for $50,000, let's say, would you be willing to give away $50,000 at the same time? Not instead of, would you be willing to give away $50,000 at the same time? If not, would you buy a car for $25,000 and give away $25,000? What I love about this is, 
it's a very practical way to approach this idea of our call to be generous and God's blessing on our life to still provide everything we need and more, right? It's a kind of really practical way to balance those two things, that we're not being robbed, we're not giving literally all of our money away so that we have nothing and we die early, like we kind of thought when the Macedonians might have been going. This is this balance between God's abundant blessing and provision for us, as well as being called to be generous. So this is a challenge for this week. If you're already across this stuff, this is nothing's been new today, and it's all boring, and I'm sorry. If not, then this challenge is for you. Your next big purchase, whatever it is, would you be willing to give the same amount away? Would you give the same amount away? It could be the next holiday. It could be a new car. It could be the new iPhone 14 Pro Max. Whatever the thing is, whatever the next big purchase is, would you be willing to give the same amount away? Let me pray, hey? We'll wrap this up. Thank you, Jesus. I don't, know what I, I don't know that I need to say anything else other than that. Thank you for being a God who blesses. It's so easy to get caught up thinking that this whole Christianity thing is just about doing enough, about being good enough, about doing the right things in the right way, about ticking all the boxes. I, I knew that in my life, but as... As I've come to experience your goodness, God, your blessing, I cannot help but think otherwise, that you are such an abundant and blessing, God, that this is what you are. It's not even that you do what you just are. This is the kind of God you are. And we see it on the cross, Jesus, as we think about how... What, what, as we can't even get a, a real good glimpse or understanding of what that cost you and what that meant, you, meant for you. But we know what it means for us. We know the, the beginnings of what it means for us. And so, Jesus, I pray that that would be the, the, the mindset and the picture, the heart as we walk out of this place, that that's the kind of God we have. And so if He's a God who's willing to do that, of course He is a God who is going to bless us as we go about life, wanting to follow you, Jesus, follow you in this same mindset of generosity. And so I pray today as we finish, as we walk out these doors, Jesus, that that would be the people that you've called us to, that we would follow in those footsteps, we would take action in that way, we would be a generous people to this world, because that's how we'll see thousands of lives transformed by the gospel by being a people set apart and different in a very positive and loving and generous way. So yeah, we thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we thank you. We pray it all in your name. Amen. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did and you want more LifePoint content, subscribe to our channel right now. Or if you're in the area around Morton Bay or Rothwell, head to our service. Sunday, we'd love to see you there. LifePoint.org.au for all the details. We'll see you soon.